Thomas and friends, making tracks to great destinations. Visit from Thomas. It was a beautiful day on the island of Sodor. Thomas was taking Sir Topham Hatt to the new school construction site. Sir Topham Hatt had given the land for the new school. Thomas's friends were all busy preparing the site. A school is the proper use for this land, Sir Topham Hatt said proudly. Let me show you the football field, said Miss Jenny. Buster was having a wonderful time rolling the earth flat. It'll be a great football field, said Miss Jenny. Great, said Sir Topham Hatt. Alfie was happily digging foundation trenches for the school library. It will be a splendid library, said Miss Jenny. Splendid, said Sir Topham Hatt. And this will be the swimming pool, she said. She explained that Oliver had to dig carefully. Obviously. A swimming pool must have very straight sides, she said. Obviously, said Sir Topham Hatt. He was impressed. Soon, his visit was over, and he was on his way home. Max was becoming impatient. Hurry up, he scowled. But Oliver would not be hurried. <laughs> he was determined to dig carefully. Suddenly, his bucket hit something hard. He slowly scraped away the earth. Hurry up there, roared Max. But I found something, cried Oliver. Look! Rubbish, snipped Max. It might be important, said Oliver's operator. I'll call Miss Jenny, said the foreman. And Miss Jenny called Sir Topham Hatt. And Sir Topham Hatt called the experts. Amazing, said the expert with the red mustache. This is a dinosaur bone. A dinosaur bone, said Ned. Dinosaurs were animals that lived a long time ago, said Miss Jenny. Their bones are all that's left. Well, Oliver, said the expert with the fuzzy beard, I wonder if you'd do some more digging for us. Yes, sir, beamed Oliver. He was excited. Soon, the experts roped off the area. Oliver changed over to his smallest chisel. This job called for delicate digging. Soon, Oliver found some more bones. Ooh. And some more. Mm. And some more. He had uncovered the skeleton of a whole dinosaur. Everyone cheered. This is an important day for the island of Sodor, said Sir Topham Hatt. Thanks to Oliver's careful digging, said Miss Jenny. It makes me proud to be an excavator, said Alfie. A man with a camera even took Oliver's picture. The next morning, Thomas brought Sir Topham Hatt to the yards. It seems we have a celebrity here, he said. It's Oliver, said Ned. With his dinosaur, said Jack. 
The front page, no less, said Miss Jenny. Oliver was proud. Jack owns up. Thomas's friends were excited. He was taking them to the warehouse. Jack couldn't wait to get to work. Hurry, Thomas, he called. I'm going as fast as I can, chuffed Thomas. Don't mind Jack, called Alfie. He's always in a hurry. Soon, Thomas had delivered Jack and Alfie to the warehouse. Miss Jenny warned them all about the very busy site. So you must be careful, she said. Anyone causing an accident will be sent back to the yard immediately, added the foreman. Ned was worried. He sometimes caused accidents, but he didn't want to be sent back to the yard. Don't worry, said his operator. I'll make sure you don't back into anything. Everyone was working very carefully. Ned's operator guided him around corners and through the stacks of bricks. Oh boy, said Ned proudly. He was having fun. Jack was having fun too, but he wasn't being careful at all. Slow down, Jack, Kelly boomed. You'll have an accident. Not me, Jack shouted cheerfully. Thomas could see Jack was being careless. He hoped his friend wouldn't get into trouble. But Jack did get into trouble. He backed into a stack of roofing slate and smashed it into tiny pieces. Blistering buckets, said Jack. He looked around. No one had seen him break the slate. Not even his operator. Jack knew he had been naughty. But he didn't want to get sent back to the yard. So he filled his bucket full of gravel and drove away. Ned didn't see the broken slate and rolled right over it. Ned! cried his operator. You've knocked over the slates! I didn't do it, protested Ned. It wasn't me. But there was nothing Ned could do. It was an accident. His operator would have to call Miss Jenny. It's not fair. It's not fair, grumbled Ned. Alfie pulled up just as Jack saw Ned driving slowly away. Where's Ned going? asked Jack. He knocked over some roofing slate, said Alfie. Thomas is taking him back to the yard. Jack knew it was all his fault. What should he do? Alfie could see Jack was upset. What's wrong? he asked. But Jack didn't answer. He raced off without a word. Wait! Jack shouted. Wait! Miss Jenny, Ned didn't break the slate. I did. And Jack told her what he had done. Miss Jenny was cross. It was brave of you to own up, she said. But what am I to do with you? Send me back to the yard, said Jack sadly. And so she did. As Jack was being loaded on Thomas's low loader, he called to Ned. I'm sorry you got blamed for my accident. I should have owned up earlier. That's all right, said Ned. But I'm glad it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me, sang Ned as he steamed back to work. Good for you, Jack, Thomas called. Good for you. All the way back to the yard, Jack felt good. Deep down in his pistons, he knew he'd done the right thing. On site with Thomas. It was a simmering summer day on the island of Sodor. Sir Topham Hatt had sent Thomas to help Jack and his friends at the construction site. 
They were busy working on the foundations for the new community center. Patrick was pouring concrete for a new platform. Roasting radiators, it's hot, panted Jack. Makes my boiler ache, said Thomas. Out of the way, young'uns, teased Patrick. Someone important coming through. What makes you so important, huffed Jack? Concrete, rattled Patrick. We're important too, said Alfie. But I'm the most important, said Patrick. He's a bit cheeky, puffed Thomas as he chuffed away. But Alfie and Jack were curious. Who was the most important? Jack couldn't wait to ask Byron. Is Patrick the most important, asked Jack. Nonsense, said Byron. Patrick can't pour his mushy concrete until I level the site. That makes me the most important. Alfie made a beeline for Oliver. Slow down, purred Oliver. What's got you racing around in this heat? Patrick said he was the most important, panted Alfie. Is that true? Oh, my no, said Oliver politely. Digging the foundations is the most important. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. Transport, boasted Nelson. Without transport, there wouldn't be any construction. That makes me the most important. Our operators, declared Ned. They're in charge of safety. They're definitely the most important. I give up, clattered Jack. They can't all be the most important, said Alfie. They were confused. When Thomas returned, he could see that everyone was talking about who was the most important. Even Max and Mom. I'm the most important, dieseled Max. I am, boasted Monty. I can hold more in less time than anyone else. And before their operators could stop them, they were off to get even bigger loads. Max was getting the biggest load he could carry. More, boomed Max. So was Monty. More, boomed Monty. I think that's enough, said Oliver politely. More and hurry. If you say so. Max, Monty, Kelly called. Slow down! Thomas could see Max and Monty were headed for trouble. I'm the most important, stopped Max. I am, blasted Monty. I am, I am. Look out! shouted Patrick. Ooh! Flatten my fenders, shouted Monty. Not my fault, called Max. My beautiful concrete, moaned Patrick. My beautiful blue paint, moaned Thomas. <laughs> Miss Jenny was cross when she heard the news. I'm very disappointed in you two, she said to Max and Monty. You've caused a lot of trouble. And look at poor Thomas. We were only trying to show who's the most important, groaned Max. You're all part of a team, said Miss Jenny. There's no such thing as most important. Not even Patrick, clattered Jack. Patrick, scolded Miss Jenny. Were you bragging about concrete again? I might have said something. Percy's Scary Tale. It was a foggy, foggy Halloween night. So Topham Hatt had sent Percy to work with his friend Alfie. Percy was glad he would be with a friend on Halloween. Alfie was on a night job. He was helping mend the road through Maithwaite Forest. Percy had arrived during the workman's break. Kelly was going to tell a Halloween story. I hope it's not too spooky, said Percy. Me too, said Alfie. 
He didn't like being scared either. Rubbish, snarled Max. It's just a story, sneered Monty. Shh, said Jack. Then Kelly began. Once upon a time, there was an old steam truck. He was very cross. Someone had taken one of his headlamps. And everyone listened quietly as Kelly told the story of the one-eyed truck. And finally, the one-eyed truck chased the loader into the deepest, darkest part of the forest. Then what happened, asked Isabella. Luckily, the loader got away. But according to legend, the one-eyed truck still wanders the forest, blowing his whistle and looking for a headlamp, whispered Kelly. Maybe he wants yours. That was the best story yet, said Jack. I hope I never meet the one-eyed truck, gulped Alfie. Me too, cried Percy. Stuff and nonsense, rattled Monty. Break's over, said Kelly. Back to work. Percy liked working with Alfie. Alfie is small. So is Percy. Alfie is green. So is Percy. They were having a wonderful time. But Max and Monty were up to mystery. It's the one-eyed truck, cried Max. Scaredy, scaredy, teased Monty. Stop that, boomed Jack. Pick on someone your own size. Max and Monty just laughed. Later, Max and Monty had settled down. Take these loads to the tip in the forest, said the foreman, and be careful, it's very dark. Yes, sir, said Monty and Max, and they left. As they drove deeper into the forest, it got darker and darker. The woods were full of spooky shapes and shadows. It was very scary. Suddenly, Max and Monty didn't feel so brave. What was that? clattered Max. An owl, said Monty. I hope. And that? cried Max. I don't know, said Monty. It was just a fox. But Monty and Max didn't know that. They had just arrived at the dump when suddenly they heard a shrill whistle. Then they saw a single headlamp through the trees. It's the one-eyed truck, shouted Monty. They dumped their loads and raced away as fast as their wheels could carry them. He's after us, cried Max. It's the one-eyed truck, yelped Monty. There is no one-eyed truck, said Kelly. It's just a story, chuffed Alfie. Well, what's behind us then, said Monty. It's Thomas, said the foreman. Thomas, said Percy happily. Hello, Percy, called Thomas. Sir Topham Hatch sent me with some more freight cars. Monty and Max felt silly. They went a beautiful shade of red. But everybody else had a good laugh especially Percy and Alfie. <laughs> Kelly's Windy Day. Thomas and Kelly had just arrived at the new library site. The wind's blowing hard, chuffed Thomas. Too hard, frowned Kelly. Strong winds are dangerous for a crane. The wind was blowing so hard that Jack and his friends could hardly get their work done. Kelly's crane arm didn't like the wind. Uh-oh, this is bad. Look out, cried Jack. But it was too late. Are you all right, Jeff Thomas? I think so, but is anyone else hurt? No, said Jack. But you've demolished the shed. Soon Kelly was back on Thomas's low loader. I'm sorry, Miss Jenny, said Kelly. It wasn't your fault, Kelly, said Miss Jenny. We'll get you back to the yard so the repairman can look at those wheels. 
I'm glad it's only your wheels, said Thomas. Me too, said Kelly. But he was worried. What if he fell over again and hurt someone? That night, the wind blew and the rains pounded down. The repairman worked all night fixing Kelly's wheels. The next morning, the sheds were empty. Everyone had gone to work, except Kelly. The rain had stopped, but the wind was still blowing, and he was worried. Then Miss Jenny came to the sheds with urgent news. Isabella has come off the road at the quarry bridge, she said. We must rescue her at once. Kelly was still afraid he might fall over and hurt someone. Can't you send someone else, he asked. Kelly, there is no one else. Isabella's in trouble, said Miss Jenny, and we must rescue her. Isabella was scared. She didn't like teetering on the edge of the road like a seesaw. Soon, Kelly and Miss Jenny arrived. Isabella, are you all right? asked Miss Jenny. I think so, answered Isabella. Kelly had to remove the piano first. The wind blew and the piano swayed. Oh dear, be careful. Soon, Kelly lowered the piano safely to the ground. Now he had the hardest job of all, to rescue Isabella. Slowly, he started to pull Isabella back onto the road. The wind blew harder. Isabella began to teeter. Oh, oh! Kelly was worried. He stopped. What's wrong, cried Isabella. The wind's too strong, said Kelly. You can do it, Kelly, called Miss Jenny. You can do it. Kelly knew he couldn't let the wind stop him. He started his winch again. He pulled harder. And harder. Mind my paint, the cheeky truck cried. Isabella was finally back on the road. Phew. Well done, Kelly, said Miss Jenny. Well done. Thank you, Kelly, said Isabella. At last, Kelly had his confidence back. Isabella was on her way again. And Thomas could see that Kelly was happy. A happy day for Percy. It was a gray, cloudy day on the island of Sodor. Percy was taking Alfie and Jack to Kronk Station. Jack and his friends were going to prepare the site for a new repair shed. But rain had made the site a muddy, mucky mess. Mud can be dangerous, warned Miss Jenny, so remember. Safety first, said Byron proudly. And that means no carelessness, she said to Max and Monty. Yes, Miss Jenny, they clattered. <laughs> Jack and Alfie were having a wonderful time. Alfie liked mud. This was the muddiest mud he had ever seen. Mud! Glorious mud! Alfie shouted as he spun around. Byron was working very carefully. His cuts were straight and precise. Look at that, he chugged. A work of art. But no one noticed how carefully Byron was working. Max and Monty were still up to no good. Bust my buffers, cried Percy. What do you think of my trench, Oliver? Byron asked proudly. But Oliver didn't answer. 
He was too busy trying not to sink in the mud. Byron was upset. He wanted someone, anyone, to say, well done. Max and Monty were still up to no good. Ready? Go! Watch out! shouted Alfie. But it was too late. Max broke the water supply pipe. Water gushed everywhere. Suddenly, Alfie was sinking into a muddy hole. Help! he cried. I'll get him! clattered Jack. No! shouted the foreman. You'll get stuck too! The workman shut off the water. But there was no way Alfie could get himself out. Byron! Miss Jenny cried. Can you help Alfie? I'm coming, Alfie! he shouted. Byron could see Alfie was sinking in the mud. Grab my blade! called Byron. Alfie reached out. I can't reach it, he cried. Careful, Byron, shouted Miss Jenny. Careful, you'll sink too. But Byron inched closer and closer and closer. Miss Jenny was worried. I've got it, shouted Alfie. Hold on, cried Byron. Come on, Byron, Kelly whispered. Byron struggled and pulled and strained. At last, Byron pulled Alfie to safety. Alfie was happy to be out of the mud, and Percy was glad his friend was safe. Well done, Byron, he said. Yes, well done, said the foreman. Well done, shouted Kelly. Well done, shouted everyone. Byron was proud. He had more well dones than he knew what to do with. That night at the yards, Miss Jenny had stern words for Max and Monty. You'll be spending the next three days in your sheds, she said, and you should be ashamed of yourselves. You could have seriously hurt someone with your callousness. We're sorry, Miss Jenny, said Monty and Max, and they truly were. A Tale for Thomas Sir Topham Hatt had a special for Thomas. You're to take two of Miss Jenny's machines to Maithwaite Forest. They're repairing the lightning tree. Yes, sir, said Thomas. Jack and Alfie were excited. They couldn't wait to see the lightning tree. Why is it called the lightning tree, asked Thomas. It was struck by lightning, said Jack. It's a very old and rare and special tree, added Miss Jenny which is why we need to repair it. But how will we know which one it is, asked Alfie. You'll know, Kelly laughed. It's the biggest tree in the forest. We need to prop it up before it falls over, said Miss Jenny. So be careful, all of you, and remember, safety first, Jack and Alfie called. Beep, beep. Jack and Alfie made their way through the forest. Look, gasped Alfie. The lightning tree, cried Jack. The foreman had inspected the damage. Roots were pulled up. The lightning scar was long and deep. The tree looked like it would soon topple over. Jack and Alfie approached very slowly. They had remembered what Miss Jenny said about being careful. But Max and Monty were racing recklessly through the forest. Look out, cried Alfie. You'll hit the tree, shouted Jack. But it was too late. Max crashed into Monty and Monty crashed into the lightning tree. Who put that there, grumbled Monty. 
The tree's falling down, shouted Jack. Not my fault, called Max. We must save it, cried Alfie. Help, Jack! I'm coming, called Jack. Move aside, little fella, said Oliver. Oliver braced his mighty arm against the tree, but the tree was too heavy. Kelly, shouted Jack, we need more help. Before long, Kelly was helping too. The three of them struggled to hold the tree upright. Get the props, called Kelly's operator. Jack raced off to get the props from Thomas. The machine strained to hold up the tree, but they were getting very tired. Soon the prop trolley had been attached to Jack and he was on his way. Thomas hoped Jack would get to the lightning tree in time. Jack went as fast as his wheels would carry. Alfie pushed and pushed until his arm ached. I don't think I can hold this much longer, groaned Oliver. But Jack raced up just in time. The workmen soon attached the props. The lightning tree was safe. Hooray, groaned Alfie. Miss Jenny was pleased. A terrific job, she said. The lightning tree is saved. Kelly, Oliver, Jack, and Alfie were proud. But no thanks to you two, she said to Monty and Max. You'll return to the yacht immediately. Max and Monty were ashamed. They knew they were in trouble. Later, Thomas was taking Alfie and Jack back to Miss Jenny's. Look, cried Alfie. You can see it from here, called Jack. It was the lightning tree. Thomas was glad it was saved. Thomas and the Moles. There had been a big storm on the island of Sodor. Trees were down and fences had been blown over. Kelly and Isabella had been clearing fallen trees since the crack of dawn. Ned and Max were helping remove a landslide. And Nelson and Oliver were on their way to clear Henry's tunnel. Sir Topham had sent Thomas to take his friends to the soccer field. We must leave immediately, said Miss Jenny. The car park is covered with fallen trees. Tomorrow was the big game, said Thomas. We'll have to move the trees today, clattered Jack. You could rely on us, Steve Buster. I'm sorry, Buster, said Miss Jenny kindly, but this is a job for lifters, pushers, and haulers. Buster was sad. Buster watched as everyone left. Everyone's got a job but me, he said. Thomas knew his friend Buster was unhappy. Nobody likes to be left out. At the soccer field, everyone was working very hard clearing up the fallen trees. Thomas could see there was lots to do, but nothing for his friend Buster. Buster was upset. It's not fair, he puffed. I want to help too. The work had gone very well. They were almost finished when Isabella arrived with the new goalposts. Then Miss Jenny went onto the soccer field. Oh my goodness, she cried. Hills. Miss Jenny would need Buster after all. 
Thomas returned to the yards as fast as he could. Buster, I've come to take you to the soccer field, he chuffed cheerfully. Miss Jenny needs you urgently. Buster was so excited he thought his boiler would burst. Yay! He was very happy. There was nothing better than being needed urgently. Soon, they arrived at the soccer field. After Buster was unloaded, he was amazed by what he saw. Bowl hills, he cried excitedly. Hundreds of them! It looks like a giant chocolate chip cookie, only green. This was the moment he had been waiting for. Buster clanked and sputtered and flattened and smoothed. Even the moles who had hurried to the sideline stayed to watch. He's good, very good. His smoke was blowing, his steam was white and feathery. We'll do it again. In no time at all, the soccer field was flat again. Well done, said the coach. The game can start right on time, said Isabella. Everyone congratulated Buster, but Miss Jenny gave him the nicest praise of all. She told him simply that he'd been really useful. Buster was proud. And all the way home, Thomas could see that Buster was happy. It's a grand thing to be really useful. Percy helps out. It was summer on the island of Sodor. Percy enjoyed working in the sunshine, and he liked being able to say hello to his friends. Hello, Nelson, Percy called. Nelson was so busy he barely had time to honk back. He was carrying machines everywhere, from the yard to the sites, and then all the way home. Day after day, Nelson was carrying, 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 until his axles ached. Just once, he thought to himself, I'd like to be carried. That night, Nelson had a dream. He dreamt he was sailing through the countryside. The breeze was blowing, he was enjoying himself, and he realized he was being carried. The next morning, Miss Jenny woke Nelson from his dream. Thomas has had an accident at Maithwaite Crossing, said Miss Jenny. Sir Topham Hatt needs you to take him to the repair yard. Nelson hoped his friend Thomas was all right. When Nelson arrived, he saw Thomas had come off the rails and broken a wheel. Thank you for coming, chuffed Thomas cheerfully. We'll get you back in no time, replied Nelson. Nelson had to be very careful. He'd never carried a steam engine before. Thomas's driver and Nelson's operator set to work at once. Nelson struggled as he winched Thomas aboard. Whoa, you're heavier than a bulldozer and a steamroller put together, Nelson exclaimed. Thomas was surprised. I'm only a tank engine, he said. Soon Nelson was on his way, but Thomas was heavy. Nelson had to work very hard. He puffed, he panted, he pulled. Soon they were making excellent time. 
Thomas was impressed. You're a very good carrier, said Thomas. Thank you, said Nelson. I pull freight cars and passenger cars all day long, added Thomas. It's good to be carried for a change. I'd like to be carried sometimes, said Nelson. But who would be big enough to carry me? Soon they arrived at the repair yard. Well done, said Sir Topham Hatt. You are a really useful truck. Nelson was tired, but he felt very proud. You can leave Thomas on the low loader, said Sir Topham Hatt. Miss Jenny needs you back at the yards immediately. Yes, sir, said Nelson. I'll drive as fast as I can. That won't be necessary, said Sir Topham Hatt. I'm taking you, cried Percy. Nelson could not believe what he had heard. Soon, Nelson was aboard Percy's low loader, and with a shout of, Thank you, everyone, they were off. Percy was giving Nelson a splendid ride. It was as magical as he had dreamed. The sky was blue, the trees were green. All Nelson had to do was look and listen as the beautiful Soda countryside rolled peacefully by. What an excellent day, said Nelson cheerfully. Percy was happy. His friend was enjoying himself. The Tortoise and the Hare Buster the Steamroller loves the feeling of speed the sun on his back, and the wind on his rollers. Don't fall asleep, chuffed Thomas. I'm thinking, said Buster. But he wasn't. He was dreaming about what it would feel like to win a race. Thomas had brought Buster to the Sodor Auto Racetrack, where his friends were working. They were going to finish the track today. It was a responsible job. The track had to be made safe. Buster flattened the track around the final bend. He was still dreaming about winning a race. And the winner is Buster, the fastest steamroller in the world. Vroom, vroom, Buster cried. You think you're fast? teased Monty. If you were going any slower, you'd be going backwards, teased Max. <laughs> but Buster paid no attention. He was having too much fun. Finally, the work was finished, and Miss Jenny came to inspect the site. You're a good crew, said Miss Jenny, but the track still needs testing. Can I test it, Miss Jenny? asked Buster. I'm the fastest steamroller in the world. More like the slowest, snickered Max. Monty snickered too. <laughs> Perhaps all three of you should test it, said Miss Jenny. The foreman will give you the all clear, but remember, no speeding. Of course not, said Monty. But Max and Monty knew they were going to go as fast as they could. <laughs> they waited for the foreman to give the all clear signal. I'm ready, cried Buster. You couldn't beat a snail, said Max. Not even a sleepy snail, added Monty. The foreman raised his flag. Max and Monty were speeding away. You jumped the signal, grumbled Monty. Did not, snapped Max. Buster trundled happily down the track as fast as his rollers would carry him which wasn't very fast at all. Monty was so cross, he bumped Max. Ow, cried Max, you dented me. You're in the way, snapped Monty. Max was still cross with Monty. He decided to bump him back. Before they knew it, they skidded off the track and into a ditch. Mm, 
said the bull. Woo! said Monty and Max, and they struggled out of the ditch. They were speeding towards the finish. Monty and Max sped down the track, but Buster was trundling towards the finish. Go, Buster! cheered his friends. No, said Monty. It can't be, said Max. But it was too late. Buster chuffed and puffed across the finish line. When Max and Monty crossed the line, they were still arguing. I came second, cried Max. Third, snapped Monty. You won, Buster, said Jack. And I wasn't even speeding, he said. When Thomas came to collect Buster, he was pleased. I brought a steamroller, he said, but I'm taking a champion back. And he helped prove the track is safe without speeding, added Miss Jenny. Buster was proud. Vroom, vroom, he said as Thomas chuffed past Monty and Max. I did come second, said Max. Third, snapped Monty. Thomas's trusty friends. Thomas was taking his friend Ned to the old brickworks. Ned was excited. Today I get to demolish, called Ned. Demolish, Chef Thomas? Knock buildings down, cried Ned cheerfully. Thomas thought it strange that his friends were always excited about knocking buildings down. Miss Jenny had shown the foreman the demolition plans. It's time to go to work, she said. And remember... Safety first, cried Ned and Oliver. Oh boy, said Ned. I can't wait to knock this building down. Oh my, Ned. You're not here to demolish, rattled Oliver. You're supposed to scoop up the rubble. Ned was disappointed. He really wanted to knock buildings down. Ned was usually in trouble for breaking things, but today it wouldn't matter. Soon, Oliver was fitted with a wrecking ball. Knock this wall down first, the foreman called. Stand back, if you please, called Oliver. Mm -mm, said Oliver. The wall didn't fall down. Oliver swung his wrecking ball as hard as he could. <clears throat> the wall still didn't fall down. We need a bigger wrecking ball, cried the foreman. In no time, Oliver was fitted with a bigger wrecking ball. But still, the wall didn't fall down. Could I help? Ned asked hopefully. No, said the foreman. This is Oliver's job. Ned was sad. This is the strongest wall I've ever seen, said Oliver's operator. Then the foreman checked the wall again. We'll send for an even bigger wrecking ball, he said. Ned had gone back to loading rubble into Thomas's freight cars, but his heart wasn't in it. Ned, shouted Thomas, the rubble goes in the freight cars. Sorry, said Ned. He was dreaming of knocking buildings down. Finally, Oliver was fitted with the biggest wrecking ball he had ever lifted. He aimed very carefully, and he swung with all his might. But the wall didn't fall down. Oh, bother, said Oliver. This building will never come down, groaned his operator. Ned was still dreaming of knocking buildings down and wasn't watching where he was going. Look out, cried his operator, but it was too late. The chimney rocked. The bricks crumbled. The workman and the foreman took cover. Oliver and Thomas watched in amazement. Oop. 
Oops, said Ned. Hooray! cheered the workmen. Ouch, said Oliver. Oh! Oh! <clears throat> Oliver was dirty and dented. And Thomas's freight cars were full. Bust my buffers, cried Thomas. I'm loaded! I did it! I did it, cried Ned proudly. Smash the smithereens, he steamed. Do you want me to break anything else? Oh! No, sighed Oliver. I think you've done enough for one day. Mm. Alfie has kittens. It was a beautiful day on the island of Sodor. Thomas was bringing his friend Alfie to a demolition site. Hello, Thomas, rattled Jack. Hello, Jack, puffed Thomas. I guess everyone likes demolition, said Thomas. I love demolition, said Alfie. It's when we get to knock buildings down. That's supposed to be fun, asked Thomas. The best fun, cried Alfie, and he swooped down the ramp. Look out, small fry, boomed Max. I'm not a small fry, said Alfie crossly. He didn't like being teased about his size. But later that morning, Alfie was happy that the foreman had sent him to work with Ned. Ned wouldn't make him feel small. But as Alfie pulled up, Ned swung his bucket. Watch out, cried Alfie. Sorry, said Ned. I didn't see you. You're smaller than you look. This made Alfie feel even smaller. Later, Alfie was working hard. Hurry up, half pint, teased Monty. Not half pint, wheezed Max. It's small fry. <laughs> Alfie was upset. At the workman's coffee break, Thomas could see that Alfie was unhappy. What's wrong, he asked. I don't like being small, complained Alfie. As long as you're useful, said Thomas helpfully, it doesn't matter what size you are. Alfie thought about this for a moment. Break's over, shouted Kelly. Back to work! That afternoon, Alfie was determined to be really useful. He was helping Oliver demolish a building. Oliver's giant scissor claw grabbed the top of the wall. Stop, cried Alfie. I can hear something. Everyone stopped work. But no one could hear a thing. I already checked inside, said the foreman. Small fry is hearing things, sneered Max. <laughs> I did hear something. I really did. The foreman looked inside again, and he was surprised. There's a mother cat in here, and she's got kittens. We must rescue them, said Alfie. The building isn't safe, said the foreman. I can't send my men in there. I'll go, said Alfie bravely. I'm small enough to fit in. In no time, Alfie wriggled inside. The building creaked and plaster flew. Alfie held up his scoop for the cat and kittens to jump in. Here, kitty, kitty, Alfie coaxed. But the cat and kittens didn't move. Suddenly, the upper wall started to crumble. Hurry, kitty, kitty, Alfie cried. But it was too late. Quick as a wink, Alfie covered the cat and her kittens with his scoop. And just in time. Meow, said the cat. Meow, meow, said the kittens. Shoo, said Alfie. The cat and kittens were safe. Well done, said Miss Jenny. It's a fine family of kittens. 
I couldn't have rescued them if I'd been any bigger, said Alfie. You may be small, said Kelly, but you got a big heart. And a really useful scoop, said Thomas. <laughs> Alfie was proud, and he never complained about being small again. Mud, glorious mud. It was a rainy, muddy day on the island of Sodor. Thomas was glad he didn't have to work in the mud like Miss Jenny's machine. The machines were digging foundations for the new dairy barn. Isabella was driving very carefully. She didn't want to get dirty. Isabella never wants to get dirty. Hurry up, rattled Alfie. You always take the long way around. I take the clean way round, huffed Isabella. Suddenly, Alfie's engine sputtered. Help, he cried. I'm out of diesel. The rest of the machines were running out of fuel, too. Jack sputtered and stopped. I can't even bounce my bucket, he said. Without more diesel, we'll never finish this job on time, said Miss Jenny. The foreman had bad news. The fuel truck's broken down, he said. It can't bring the diesel. I'll call Sir Topham Hatt, said Miss Jenny. We need to get some diesel fuel to Miss Jenny, said Sir Topham Hatt. Thomas, I want you to leave for Kronk Station immediately. Yes, sir, chuffed Thomas. It's a good thing you steamers don't use diesel, said Miss Jenny. Isabella, I'm sending you to meet Thomas. So off with you, and be careful. Isabella gritted her gears and steamed off for Kronk Station. And she was hoping she wouldn't get too dirty. She saw the road was flooded. Water was up to her axles, and Isabella's paintwork was getting dirty, but she didn't stop. Thomas was steaming as fast as he could to get the fuel to Isabella. Suddenly, Isabella saw a policeman. Stop, he said. There's been a mudslide. The road is blocked. Isabella knew Miss Jenny's machines were counting on her. Then I'll drive across the field, she said bravely, and left the road and skidded across the muddy field. Yuck, she cried. Isabella was so dirty, she didn't even look like herself. But she wouldn't give up. Finally, she pulled into Kronk Station, exhausted. Isabella! cried Thomas. You made it! Only just. Soon, the fuel drums were loaded, and Isabella was on her way. By now, all Miss Jenny's machines were out of fuel. The site had never been so quiet. Isabella sloshed and splashed and struggled through the muddy water. Suddenly, the machines heard a strange rattle and a rumble. The muddiest, grubbiest flatbed truck they had ever seen steamed through the gates. Isabella! cried Alfie. You made it! cried Miss Jenny. Soon, the machines were full of fuel and happily back at work. You've been really useful, Beam Miss Jenny. A job well done. I knew she'd do it, boasted Jack. You should be proud of yourself, Miss Jenny said. I am, answered Isabella. But I could use a washdown. <laughs>